Um, our next speaker is Ronaldo Vibart. He's a senior scientist with AgriSearch based at Grasslands and Palmerston North. He describes himself as an Argentinian agronomist come farm manager who's been transformed into an animal and farm system scientist. <gasps> His uh, research focus is on the soil plant grazing dynamic, including uh, greenhouse gases uh, across complex landscapes. Ronaldo. Good morning. Thank you, Warren. Um, that was very kind of you. Um, what a privilege. Um, I just want to thank my co-authors on this, on this work, um, especially those coming from uh, Beef and Lamb New Zealand, Andrew Burt and Jane Crystal. Without you guys, we wouldn't have been able to, to come up with this. So just as a means of background, uh, New Zealand sheep and beef farms, um, they're really diverse. As you know, it's a diverse spectrum of biophysical resources and management. And um, sheep and beef livestock, uh, unfortunately, about 50% of the enteric methane emissions come from that particular herd. And of course, there's Hewaka Ikenoa. I guess no much more needed on that. But simply that um, it has a very strict milestones. Um, you know that by the end of 2022, this is, that is this year, all New Zealand farmers and growers will know their on farm greenhouse gas emissions, and that is adding uh, methane emissions to nitrous oxide emissions. And then by 2025, which is just around the corner, all farms will have a plan to manage their greenhouse gas emissions. So the objective of, of this piece of work was to develop a farm data set um, uh, with greenhouse gas emissions, and we looked at a data set that has 170 farms. Um, the second objective was to examine the relationships between all of those vari variables that describe farm management, biophysical resources, uh, and greenhouse gas emissions, and to provide a baseline for trends in farm scale greenhouse gas emissions. So quite, quite ambitious. But we are talking baseline. We won't be, I won't be talking about uh, mitigation nor adoption. So we went with a modeling approach. Um, again, 170 farms um, anonymous, anonymously provided. So there's no mapping of where these farms are. Um, we did that in Pharmax. Um, unfortunately, it is single year data. Um, and we looked at these farms as feasible farms. So in other words, that feed on offer needed to match animal needs. Um, again, we looked at greenhouse gas emissions in terms of methane plus nitrous oxide per effective hectare. So by effective, I mean grazing plus crops, something that's growing um, those two. And Pharmax uses the agricultural inventory model uh, equations, and this was back in 2019, so you will navigate through a few differences that these days the inventory model has. So um, we looked at farm production and financial data provided by Beef and Lamb, as mentioned. And as you know, Beef and Lamb New Zealand has eight farm business classes. Um, but we decided to go a little bit different in terms of grouping or clustering these farms around a combination of stock units and dry matter intake. Um, stock units, again, as a measure of um, carrying capacity, if you will, stock units per effective hectare, and then dry matter intake and kilograms of dry matter uh, per effective hectare. And that allowed us, allowed us to, I hope this is coming down. Bear with me for a second. Probably not quite there, but anyway. Um, that allowed us to cluster the farms in terms of uh, intake and emissions. You'll see that in a second from anywhere from one, which is probably more on the high country South Island, right up to the high end of what would be equivalent to a uh, farm business class eight in beef and lamb, uh, right up to as those um, having more than 10 stock units per hectare and almost 7,000 uh, kgs of dry matter intake per hectare, per effective hectare. And the number of farms are listed on that last row. So that allows us to do some clustering around, around these farms. So um, 
we, we did a lot of examination in terms of visual assessment. Um, and initially, it, it was a very square Excel spreadsheet, massive one, with about more than 150 explanatory variables around the, the greenhouse gas emissions. So we had to narrow it down to less than 20, to something that we could actually quantify and do something about. Um, we looked at a correlation uh, matrix heat map, which establishes those Pearson correlations between individual variables, and we looked at a principal component analysis coming up. So in terms of results, uh, there are two graphs on the right-hand side. Uh, the top graph is looking at the emissions, again, per effective hectare, per farm class. So um, anywhere from, again, the high country South Island right up to a cropping and finishing um, as a class eight. You do see a little bit of a trend around that, but there's no clear separation around emissions. Now, when we did the feed groups, as described in the previous graph, you can see quite a, quite a range, quite a different jump in, in, in those. So that's, that's what we were after. Um, the mean uh, and range uh, as a mean value, uh, about uh, 3.7 tons of um, greenhouse gas emissions per hectare with a very wide range, as you see um, right there, and uh, in terms of kilograms of CO2 equivalents. And about 50% of the farms fell within the 2.9 to 4.5 tons. So that's, just bear in mind that for a second, that you'll see that in the next few slides. Um, what we did notice is that farms emitting around four tons had a, almost a three-fold difference in terms of animal product being produced. So massive range in that for the same emissions per hectare. And there was a similar variation in other efficiency metrics um, such as live weight gain and lamb weaning and, and a few others. That is massive and it, there's lots of numbers in there, but the ones that I really want you to probably focus on is just on greenhouse gas emissions and what that means in terms of the clustering from less than, or well, almost a ton, right up to uh, 5.4 tons on average for those groups, and then very closely um, followed by the dry matter intake for each of these um, clusters. In terms of um, the heat map, this is a one-to-one -one correlation between variables. So it's not a multi-variable, multivariate analysis. It's, it's a, still a one-to-one. -one. The diagonal in those, uh, that's the variable of interest that we're, we're after, the greenhouse gas emissions. Um, do not pay too much attention to the diagon diagonal. Is that It's the relation between one to itself, one variable to itself. But basically what you see is a clustering of things like intake, stocking rate, live weight gain, animal production, having a very high correlation with greenhouse gas emissions per hectare, as expected. Then you've got a second group that's probably less correlated and has a very poor correlation, let's put it that way, around U efficiency and lamb weaning. And then you've got the ones that antagonize, that go to the negative side against greenhouse gas emissions, which are feed conversion, uh, effective farm area, and total farm area. And you'll see that in a second on what I mean. The, the other way of presenting this is doing it through a multi. Try to get all of those correlated individual variables into one big package. The big bubbles in the background are the clustering. So cluster number one, again, the high country, low emitting per hectare, uh, low intensity, if you will, right up to the high intensity, high emitting. The big arrow in black there is greenhouse gas emissions per hectare. That's the, the variable of interest. And you can see a whole bunch of arrows going in that same direction. And that has to do, again, with intake, stocking rate, live weight gain, and animal production. Then you've got the ones that we call kind of intermediate around U efficiency, lamb weaning. And then lastly, and they're moving in slightly in the opposite direction, feed conversion, and effective farm area. And just to explain what these loadings mean when we talk about multivariate analysis, um, you did see that in, in two, in kind of in two um, axes. The principal component one, which was the one, the, the wider one at the bottom, that was led by, again, uh, a lot of the variables that are on 
can see the, the red thing there. Dry matter intake, carrying capacity, stock units, etc., and then antagonized by um, the feed conversion efficiency. And then the other one, the, the vertical one, which had the lower spread, uh, the loadings on that is very much on um, the dry matter intake and, again, antagonizing farm area and feed conversion efficiency. But we'll see that in a, in a, in a second. Um, just to add to this, um, a shortcoming from the study, of course, is that it is one year's worth of, and that caution is required when you're establishing either a baseline or trying to put a way of sequence of what your actual baseline should be. Um, in terms of greenhouse, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, enteric methane, methane total, but enteric methane especially accounted for 80% of total greenhouse gas emissions, something to keep in mind. And that um, given the low amounts of N applied, uh, that strong link with, between methane emissions and total greenhouse gas emissions is expected. And just to give you a taste for some of the variables that we also looked at in terms of U efficiency, that's the kilograms of lamb weaned per kilograms of U mated, um, you can see the five groups kind of separated there, but there's a lot of noise around some of the values on the x-axis, and, and without going into much detail. But there's a lot of, in terms of, we've separated them in terms of emissions, but a lot of these variables, uh, there's plenty of work to do, if you will, within those clusters. Again, um, this just looks at, and I'll, I'll put both together, um, I go directly to the graphs on the right, the ones in blue. That's um, stocking rate again and um, greenhouse gas emissions. And then the one at the bottom, um, you can see the annual production. Uh, it's a little, bit, a little bit more spread, but still high related to, to methane emissions. Um, I'll have to go very quickly through this. I did mention this previously, so I'll go very quickly. It's a lack of time. Um, but I just want to point out that since this work has done, there has been big changes in terms of how we quantify at a national level uh, nitrous oxide emissions. And uh, there are no new emission factors that have come out since then, and also uh, some related to slope, newer, even newer in terms of slope. So that means that in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, uh, you can see quite a reduction in terms of what it means relative to the first calculation. In terms of total emissions, of course, it gets compressed because it's only 20% of total emissions coming from nitrous oxide. So in conclusion, um, 170 farms uh, across all beef and lamb classes uh, provides a good insight into the complexity within and the variability between farms. Uh, the total feed production and feed intake drive animal production, of course, uh, and of course, highly correlated with greenhouse gas emissions. Um, changes in the methodology of nitrous oxide, and we've just mentioned the one around nitrous oxide, but in the future we could have new partitioning within the animal, that's revised from time to time, and also feed base uh, enteric methane emissions, emission factors, sorry, uh, rather than animal-based. Uh, that's something that I think in the future will be addressed. Um, in order to accommodate all of the work that's been done in different forages um, across the country. And then this work provides a, a holistic assessment of the farm scale drivers of greenhouse gas emissions and a baseline from which future trends could be established, can be established. Um, lots of people to thank you and thank you all. What a privilege to be here. Thank you. Thanks for all that.